On your feet, please. Turn around and face the flag. Let's, let's, let's face the door, okay? Place your right hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Take your seats. Review the minutes from our last meeting, which was Wednesday, January 18th. Board members, do you have any comments? No, I will uh, move to accept the Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes dated Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're going to move on to the public comment portion of the meeting. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm certain many of you probably haven't been to one of these meetings. Um, we do run by Robert's rules and a number of, of other policies that tell us <coughs> when the meeting is going to go. You can choose to comment during this open public comment, and that would be a comment on virtually anything you wish to discuss. You can also comment during any agenda item. So if you have a comment specific to something that's on the agenda, you may wish to wait and use your comment at that time. I do have public comment cards, and if anybody has come in late and would like to filter a card forward, um, I imagine that most of these are going to be held back for an agenda item, but if anybody at this time would like to comment on anything not on the agenda, now would be your time. And Tracy, I have a time when I'm left with Mr. Marcus. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Desk. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. In that case, we are going to go ahead and move on to the information section. Uh, let me go ahead and review also, actually, before we jump into that. Okay. When we do get to public Can comment... I, did you pass up on the public comments? I couldn't hear. Oh, yes. Do you have a comment of something not yeah, on the agenda? I thought you were going to call them yeah, off the other sheet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, before we get to that, let's. I'm just going to go ahead and review. The public comment is limited to three minutes. And... Uh, other than those who wish to comment now, I'm gonna go ahead and go in the order in which I received the cards. Uh, when an agenda item is presented, the staff will give a presentation on that item, and then we will call and open it for public comment, at which time, after everybody's had a chance to speak, we will close comment, and then the board will have discussion if there's an actionable item at that time, that's when that part of the business would take place. If there's not an actionable item, the board will have discussion, there will be no further comments, and then we'll move on to the next item. So, okay. Comment not on another agenda item that will be made during the public comment section. And you can go ahead and step forward to our black podium. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Or if you want to comment now. If you wanted to comment now. Oh, okay. Hello. My name is Christine Urban, and I raised five sons here in the Valley, and now I have seven grandkids. Two of them attend this school, and uh, there's more to come, so I feel like I have a place here. And I have sat where you sat for five years at a local school, and it isn't easy. And it's hard when you sit here alone, and there's not a soul out here for most of the time. And then all of a sudden, you've got a big group of people, but it's actually a healthy thing because they trust you, and that's why people are usually not here, is the way I always took it. 
Um, you know, and they're just letting you know when people are interested that there's something they want to redirect or let you know. So I'm just, it's a, a voice of support for you there. My non-agenda item is that it's grandparents a situation. So I have been asking since the beginning of the school year to be allowed in the classroom. I have so many hours of classroom um, time with all my kids growing up and bored and been on um, other uh, just fundraising boards, everything, but I guess there was a decision earlier in the year to not allow grandparents in the classroom. And my grandkids, both their parents are uh, work in the health field and in the first responder field, and it's very hard for them to ever have scheduled time in the classroom, and i just like to fill in for that gap. I think it's really important that parents kind of, and grandparents have a window into where their kids are situated in the classroom. It helps them to know um, you know what's going on in the classroom as far as you know I know my grandkids are struggling a little bit and it would be really helpful for me to be able to see what's going on in their classroom in comparison to their peers what you know where they're falling short and be able to help them because I watch them quite a bit quite honest I'm an additional parent so I know you can't respond to that because it's not on the agenda but I'd ask you maybe to put that on the agenda for next month and reconsider it. I think the reasoning was something about COVID and I think we're in a different um, time right now with COVID. I think, you know, it's time to maybe move on from that. And trust me, I'm around my grandkids all the time. So if you're worried about me, don't. <laughs> and uh, my kids are bringing in whatever I have to you guys already. So that's my, my not agenda. Was there one other, sir? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, I want to address an incident in the fourth grade class uh, that I'm receiving from parents and students who are in the fourth grade class. But before I do that, I would like to uh, relay something that happened at another elementary school last night at the board meeting where they were seeking someone to get sex education and this contractor uh, laid out a program which they're going to adopt but in questioning the, the contractor admitted that the best place, best place for sex education is in the home not in the school but the school is still going to retain her but one thing that she does do is that she does a parents orientation and then uh, two weeks prior to the instruction, the parents are given a full agenda of what is going to be discussed, and they can opt out. Apparently, in the fourth grade class, as I understand it from parents, I wasn't there, uh, they did not have the option to opt out, and a board member took advantage of that situation and addressed the students uh, about a non-academic family matter and uh, some of the students brought that home to their parents with questions that probably weren't age appropriate. Uh, and I, I think some of the parents felt that that person would not be able to make that presentation unless they had some leverage on the teacher and or superintendent. That's the feedback that I'm getting and I only convey that to you since I think that that is an issue. Um, I think suggestions for going forward, one, the school ought to adopt, I can't find it on the website, you may have it, but a parent's rights policy, which is being adopted, you know, in many different school districts. Um, there should be a focus more on um, academics versus social engineering. And three, if the information I have received is correct, then I think it's incumbent upon the board to educate the board member involved that this type of action should not take place in the classroom. Uh, many of the parents felt that the board member was taking advantage of it. And as a board member, and I've been a board member on several boards, the responsibility is to the community at large, not to your own personal uh, goals. Thank you very much. <coughs> Anybody else in the 
I have a question. That, the topic that was just broached is, is an agenda item, correct? Right? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, we're okay. We're good. Okay. We are going to move on to the information section. And um, I know our calendar. Yep, on, on the calendar there, I listed just some things that are going on. Our sixth graders are currently at Camp Peak, um, which is awesome. The, and today's board meeting. Uh, tomorrow, we will have a regular dismissal day. And on Friday, we have a minimum day, which is a 12 o'clock dismissal. Midwinter break from the 20th to the 24th. Um, a couple of days there where I'm off campus at a meeting. On Friday, March 3rd, when we come back from break, we'll be having the Michael Katz Storytelling Assemblies for all grades. Also on the 3rd is our Barn Bash. Um, and then our 5th graders will be going to Astor Camp from Friday the 10th through Saturday the 11th. A couple more superintendent meetings. And then that brings us to the next board meeting on March 15th. <clears throat> is there any board member comments or correspondence that you'd like to share? PTA report. Yep. Well, this is going to be a shorter one than normal because our focus has been solely really on the barn bash at this moment. That's obviously our big fundraiser. We're really excited. Um, we've sold 41 tickets so far, so we definitely have a ways to go. But I know that a lot of people tend to buy them last minute, so we sent flyers home with the kids yesterday. Um, a table will be set up um, soon for parents if they want to just buy tickets um, on campus, which is great however we can make it easy but yeah we're really excited about that um the other thing we did um we're doing teacher appreciation so we had um the fourth and second graders um no sorry the fifth and the first graders um did it in february and our next one will be in um, april and that's going to be led by the fourth and second grade families and they're getting together and trying to make sure the staff knows you know how much they're appreciated so that's, that's it. It's after the Barn Bash, then we're going to start focusing on all the other fun kid-related events that will be coming up. So I'll fill you in more of those in March. For all those in the room, since we have an audience, does anybody want to give one shameless plug as to what the Barn Bash is, or what the date is, or where one might buy a ticket? Yeah. Uh, the Barn Bash is March 3rd, <laughs> and it's, it's at, at the Maverick. And um, tickets are on sale on the PTA website now. You can buy them online, but we are going to have, I think, the fifth graders, so there are excellent sales force, is going to be um, putting out a table for parents to buy tickets here on school campus this week um, before we go on break and then probably the week after. And I don't know if a different grade will do it, but um, so we're trying to sell tickets. But it is our annual fundraiser. Um, this well, this is the <coughs> alternate to the jamboree. So the barn bash is what happens every other year, but it is our primary fundraiser to support arts education, music education, field trips, all of the incredible things, PE, the incredible things that our PTA does for our classroom kids. Awesome! Please come. It will be fun. <coughs> okay. Um, anything else? Okay. We're going to move on to the superintendent's report. Pam? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to discuss briefly the student privacy matter, but before that, I just want to skip down just real quick because I think we have some people who want to speak about that. Um, the Schools for Fight found Sound Finance reports, does anybody have any questions about those? The governor has released their budget. We can talk more about that later, but there are some interesting things coming down the pipe. Um, and those uh, Schools for Sound Finance reports sort of delineate out from a small school's perspective what might impact us more heavily. So um, if you read through those, we can talk about that later, but we can, I don't know if you had any questions about that. Um, it has not, if governor released his budget, it went, goes back to all the committees and then it will come back. So I don't have a lot of information at this time. It's just some pieces coming down our way. So back to the student privacy matter. Um, we recently had a situation that has brought up some discussion as to how the school handled um, a student privacy matter. The school handled the situation as best I could in accordance with the um, with the Students' Right to Privacy Act and the California anti-discrimination laws. And as concerns were raised, we did consult our legal counsel um, to make sure that we did act in accordance. I do 
I can't share, I wrote on here on the agenda that there's an actual statement from James Simpson who is acting as our legal counsel, but I, um, the statement he released actually encroaches upon student privacy, ironically, and so I can't release that letter publicly, but I can um, mention that he did in fact say that we acted according to the law and the anti-discrimination laws, and if we had handled it differently that we might have um, encroached upon student privacy or the anti-discrimination laws. So I know that it has been concerning and uh, that it's been questioned, but I just want everyone to understand that there are very specific student privacy laws that we have to follow as a public school. And so in this case, I believe that we did. And, um, and so that's really what I have to say about that. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, one more thing, quickly. I did include in your packets um, an article from, or not an article, but an excerpt from the California, California Department of Education that specific, specifically addresses this topic, and a policy briefing from CSBA, which I felt also um, was uh, there too. So you have those in your board packets. Okay. Again, we're going to go with three minutes. Gina has a timer, and basically in the order the cards were received. Kaylin. <coughs> okay, I had to write this down because I want to stick on point. Okay. I want to take a couple minutes to address the situation at hand and set the record straight that what was said in the classroom was not what people think was that, I th in my opinion, my child simply wanted her friends and her classmates to know her pronouns and her name. That was it, nothing further. It test took less than 60 seconds probably. This is my name, these are my pronouns. We left, it was really fast. She was so ready to do this because she felt so safe in her community. The kids in her class have been so, so supportive and loving. And as a result, our child has never been happier. It was like a giant weight was lifted off her shoulders and everything was better because her friends now knew who she was. I want to thank Mrs. Rennick and all the teachers and the staff at Ballard for creating such a supportive environment for my child to thrive. I can't tell you the difference this has made in helping her find the happiness that was missing before. Recently, we started learning that rumors were uh, snowballing across the valley. People were making up stories about what was said in the classroom and spreading completely outrageous and unfounded claims, as well as claims against my other children. Individuals were talking about my family sharing deeply private and personal information about a child to complete strangers. For obvious reasons, this was pretty scary to be a, a pretty scary situation to be in. Children are vulnerable enough under normal circumstances without targets being placed on their backs. I am so sorry that some parents felt that they were ambushed and perhaps had conversations they weren't ready to have with their kids. I really am. But at the end of the day, we were protecting our child's privacy, particularly on such a personal, tough matter. So I hope that all the parents in this room can understand that. And I know this topic is very familiar for some people and it's new territory, so please feel free to approach us. If you had any questions, we're always here to answer them. And whether you agree with me or not, please just remember that I'm a mom doing everything I can to keep my children safe and happy. That's it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Evie Sweeney. Ready to go. <laughs> Um, I'm Evie, and I have it's okay. I have a kid in second grade, um, and I also heard about this through my hairdresser, who has no kids here, which I found ironic. And I guess um, I was so disheartened because, um, well, first of all, legally we are in a public school system; it is not a private school system. But also. Secondly, this is, to me, as a parent, not about social engineering. 
as much as it is person and personhood. Um, so that, to me, differentiates that topic. And my third um, statement is that you're like, true. I believe that most of the parenting should be done at home. And that includes having conversations about this topic. And if you're not having conversations about this topic, then you are the one that's behind. <laughs> and so it should not fall on the child, the parents, who are already doing their best to get through the situation, the principal, who is doing the same thing as well, and the teachers. I feel like it's, it's unfairly um, being misdirected. <clears throat> Carla Ford. Hi, I'm Carla um, Ford. I have three kids at the school. And I didn't really prepare anything. I just wanted to stand up if anybody said anything that I disagreed with. And so far, <laughs> I've agreed with both of these lovely ladies. Um, I do want to thank Pam Rennick for being our fearless leader and for protecting our students and being so wonderful. I want to thank the Conroys for everything they've done for our school and how much time they've put into our school and their lovely three children. And I just, you know, with whatever you decide to teach your children in your home, I hope you consider kindness as the most important thing. And I hope that that can really be what we can all agree on. And I hope that your kids are seeing you at home being kind and speaking kindly about other children and other families. That's all. Bill Kravich? Crouch. Bill Crouch. Bill, have you already spoken? I already spoke. Okay. Yeah. As well as Christine Urban. Okay. Sue Turner Craig. Hello, my name is Sue Turner Cray and I'm here as a citizen, I'm not representing any board or anything that um, I'm part of, so I just want to let you know that first, that I'm here speaking as a person. Um, my husband and I are alumni of the Ballard School, our son um, now is in high school and we had a, a pretty good time at the Ballard School for the most part, he was here from K through 6. Um, in the past, many of the people around the community have sort of referred to this school as so great, it's like a private school, but it's not. It is a public school. And as we all know, public schools must follow the laws pertaining to the state. Um, I would like to say to Pam, thank you, for I've, I've been in communication with some people that have talked to a lot of the uh, Ballard community members. My husband and I still live in the Ballard school district, so we still pay taxes for the school, and I would like to commend you on how you responded to this situation. I'd also like to say that our son had the privilege to share the classroom with Alice, a transgender child, and it was a wonderful opportunity for education at the Ballard School of inclusion, and um, understanding um, someone who is different to yourself. And so um, I want to reach out to those parents that perhaps, you know, are now uh, finding themselves in these uh, conversations with their children to let you know that, you know, as a public school, the school were defending the privacy rights of Olivia, who I've happened to know since kindergarten and used to live across the road from Olivia. Um, and I would just like to say to please be inclusive, to be open to people that are different to yourself, and to use this as an, a, a form of education, that you can educate your children. You know, welcome to the big wide world of 2023. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Rebecca Smith. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Rebecca Smith. Hello, my name is Rebecca Smith. Um, I'm going to share with you a different perspective than what we've heard so far. Um, what happened in the fourth grade classroom is an upsetting situation. Um, there are several families now that have voiced their concern. I know Pam's aware of that. Um, the board has heard from some of them. This is by no means a privacy issue as described by Pam. The issue doesn't lie in a child changing his name. The issue is that Pam brought in two parents oh. to freely discuss a controversial topic um, with a class of students without anyone's consent. I think it's very important that the board thoroughly consider the way in which this situation was mishandled. There are only two possibilities as to how Pam Rennick decided to handle this situation. The first is that she made an influenced decision with an agenda in mind, or she was completely naive and did not realize what would come from her controversial decision. Either explanation, her decision is unacceptable. This is the leader of our school, the one who needs to be making decisions that are best benefiting our children, their families, and our teachers. The decision was reckless, concerning, and an abuse of power was shown both by Pam and Sean Conroy. I find it appropriate that Sean Conroy resigned from his, after seeing his lack of discernment in this situation. As for Pam, there is now an irreversible lack of trust in your ability to make decisions for our children. You broke trust between yourself and a teacher who gave you warning that this was inappropriate. That teacher was put in an awful position, one she never should have been put in. Our teachers need to be listened to when they voice concern. And in this case, Mrs. Young was completely disregarded. With that said, I'm proposing that our school create a parents' rights policy. I'm asking that the policy be put on the March agenda as an action item. The Orange County Board of Education two weeks ago unanimously voted in a parents' rights policy. And I strongly believe it's what we need here at Ballard. I have provided copies of this policy for you to look over. I am asking for complete transparency to be put in place in our classrooms. Parents need to be notified anytime an outside person is brought into our classroom, whether it be someone discussing or teaching on a specific topic or a counselor or therapist coming in to speak with the class or students individually. We need to be notified. If you can't send an email about what's being taught to our children, then you absolutely should not be discussing it with them. This topic discussed in the fourth grade may not have bothered some people, but the next topic allowed in the classroom might. This policy needs to be put in place as an across the board rule. The policy will eliminate situations like this from ever happening again. We cannot rely on one person's judgment and discretion. We as families deserve the right to speak to our kids at home on difficult subjects on our own time and with our own, imbu own views and opinions first. We deserve the right to pull our child from conversations we deem inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Savali. Hi. Uh, let me just start with she, her, she, her, she, her. I think if we are going to be referring to this student in any way, we need to respect um, who they are. So um, her name's Olivia, and she goes by she or her. Um, I first of all want to thank the school board and the principal. We might not know each other personally, but I understand that you all have been very supportive in this situation. So gratitude to you. Um, and. Thank you for showing Olivia and her family uh, probably what a true community could really look like. Um, the opportunity that the class shared when Olivia came out should be considered a privilege to have been witnessed. It is a reveal of something so personal and emotional that I only wish the individuals involved could realize the magnitude. Mm -hmm. Olivia could have come to school as herself, not sharing who she is, but instead created the opportunity to share in the moment. If I would have seen someone who looked like me, we probably could have struggled through life and this world together. I wish I was as brave as she has been when I was her age. 
to live in my authentic self would have changed the course of my life. She could and should be revered as a soul that is beyond praise. Thank you guys so much. Tori Smith. Pass. Michelle Doerr. Good afternoon, Superintendent Krennic, members of the board, and everyone in the community. My name is Michelle DeWord, and I just wanted to uh, first disclose I am a member of the Santa Barbara County Board of Education, and this is this is uh, one of this is my district, and you are all my constituents. I'm here to uh, to speak about board members' uh, responsibilities, their roles and responsibilities as board members, and also I'm a parent, 25 years here in the Valley. And I've raised two girls here, and I am also a grandparent. Okay, number one, becoming a highly effective school board member involves continuously honing your knowledge of how board decisions impact student learning for all students, fiscal security, and the educational future of our students in our district. Always keep in mind that all children are center of your decisions. Your success as a board member is inextricably tied to the success of your board. Going solo is a no-no. You are elected as an individual, but you will work as part of a team. Boards do have great power. It's the power to establish goals, policies, and demand accountability for reaching those goals and executing policies. It's inappropriate for board members to try to muddy accountability by trying to involve themselves in management functions. It is highly inappropriate to, and, unacceptable, and unacceptable to assert your power um, where children are present. Respect your oath. Local board membership is a public office and public trust. You should know and be informed of the expectations and aspirations of your students and parents. Many resources are available to you in this new position. Don't be in a hurry to do something. It takes time to develop governance skills. Always be transparent. Learn and understand the, the Brown Act. Remember, you are elected citizens trying to carry their, their voices of the citizens and their needs. Be open and listen to all stakeholders before making up your mind. No micromanaging school staff and work in the best interests of all students is imperative. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff C. Thanks for uh, letting me talk. My name is Jeff. I live on Cottonwood right here. I've sent three kids here. Uh, had a great experience. Uh, my daughter was also in a class with a transgender student. Um, we're here to discuss an issue that, frankly, I, I don't see the issue. I don't see the issue. Somebody tell me the issue. We have a student who said, here's who I am. Is that super problematic? You might not like it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to agree with the parents saying, hey, we want you to be who you are. But that's the incident. That's a student. That's a, that's a kid saying, I think this is who I am. This is who I want you to call me. I don't know. Somebody, I, I'm waiting for a... a Waiting to hear like what the what the problem is. I also, frankly, have seen no evidence of undue or heard. I've heard, I've heard a lot of allegation and uh, and hearsay about a board member using undue influence. I haven't seen that. I don't think that because he's a board member, his child is not allowed to say, "Hey, could you call me she? I'd like to be Olivia." I don't think that's a violation of any sacred trust. I see uh, Ballard, as I've seen it, a community school, a public school, that is, is open and welcoming and has um, diverse opinions. It'd be nice if there was more diversity, probably, because that's the world that we live in. But there's diverse opinion and part of life, and it is absolutely an educational issue to deal with people to interact with people, to work with people that we don't agree with, that we don't see eye to eye on. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. I think you guys handled it well. I don't understand what the issue is, but I'm, I'm listening. And I guess I would just like to say, come talk to me about it afterwards. I would love to hear more about it. 
Thanks. Karen Lehman. Hi, my name is Karen Lehman. I um, have two children currently at Ballard School, a fifth grader and a second grader. Um, I've also been a teacher for the last 16 years, um, and so I know what it's like to be a parent and a teacher. I taught my oldest daughter twice. I had her in the classroom, and, and when you're parenting and have school responsibilities, I know how tricky that can be trying to manage those different responsibilities. Um, I also know that in, in education, your job is to educate the whole child. So if a child comes into my classroom and has various needs or um, whatever, it's my job to address all of those, social and emotional, um, all of it, right? My primary job is to educate them, sure, but like you can't educate a child who is emotionally um, upset or dealing, grappling um, with issues. Um, I also know that I can't, okay, so second thing I'd like to say is I can't fathom expecting a 10-year-old child to walk into a classroom without some support. So to expect a child to be able to address the largeness that she addressed in the classroom without parental support feels cruel and um, unrealistic in my opinion. Um, and I have a feeling, you know, my children met um, this particular child. Um, I think my youngest was probably four and my middle child was a, a first grader. And um, immediately my four-year-old was like, hmm, is she a boy or a girl? And, you know, I had a conversation with her at that point. It was brought up from her mouth and we had a conversation. I feel like um, when my son entered first grade and this student in question um, was a kindergartner, conversations were had. Um, it was obvious that maybe this individual was a little bit different um, and it provided some awesome conversations. Um, and if you hadn't had that conversation yet and you'd been at this school for years, it's hard for me to understand the blame, or you get what I'm saying? It's hard for me to understand why that hadn't happened and if you logically would have. So like to expect the school to have given you that option, I feel like you maybe had that option for a very long time. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is um, my children were not phased at all. My son came home, told me about it in the car before we even got home, and I said, oh, how do you feel? And he said, oh, I think it's great that she felt so brave and was able to say what she needed to say. Um, my younger child was like, what? You know, like she's just oblivious <laughs> because she knows this student and loves them for them, and it's not a thing. So that's all I felt like I needed to say. Thank you. I'm a mom. I live down the street. I have three daughters come up through Ballard, and um, uh, I also had a daughter with a transgender kid in her class. And um, I, I was in a staff meeting this morning. I work at a church in Santa Barbara, and one of the staff people said, "Oh, we should sing this song." They will know we are Christians by our love. And I thought, well, that's really fun because I'm going to a meeting this afternoon where I feel like there's a lot of talk and a lot of anger about a student, a child, who is just being herself. And parents who are just trying to love that kid the way that they need to be loved. And I thought it was very ironic as a Christian that I would need to say, I am so sorry for my fellow Christians that are not willing to love a 10-year-old the way that they're asking to be loved and who criticize the parents for making the best decisions that they can in their child's life. And as my husband pointed out, we live in a diverse world. It's changing. I think this is a cultural moment. This is not a misbehavior moment. This is a moment of cultural conflict. 
You have a culture that doesn't want to change and a culture that is willing to change. And they're at odds. I think God is overarching this whole thing. God doesn't change. God has created, created us each the way that he wants us to be. God loves us. I'm sorry to be a preacher. I'm kind of a preacher. <laughs> and I think they should know we are Christians by our fucking love. I'm sorry. Not for hatred ends in we, legal things. Or I don't even know. I just, I feel very strongly that we should be known by our love. And it makes me sad that that's not the case. I, I just feel like Jesus would be bummed. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Fiona. So I went through all the Ballard from kindergarten to sixth grade, and I'm now a sophomore at San Ynez High School. I'm the child in question who had a kid in, <laughs> who had a transgender kid in my class. But you know, honestly, someone brought that up, and I completely forgot that happened because it was not strange when someone brought it up. It was a very normal topic, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the youth. It is not weird to hear about this. My little cousins, who are like five, they like learned about this that young. The world is changing. You guys need to change with the world, and I know it's uncomfortable, but you can't sit here and expect kids to not learn about it. It's everywhere, and it's not bad. It's lovely. It's wonderful. It like I don't understand what the problem is. And I just feel like you guys need to understand that you're saying you're scared for your kids, but there's nothing to be afraid of. It is completely normal. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, that will conclude. Can, I, can I speak again? I actually did mine for both, but... I did mine for an agenda oh, item and a non-agenda item. No, we had a three-minute limit on each comment. Per person. Per person. I see. Okay. We're going to go ahead and close the public comment portion of that um, and open it up to any board discussion. Done. I just want to say before we move on that I, I am proud of our school and our staff for abiding by the laws that protect the rights of children. And it is a true fact that we are all here and I think each one of us in this seat because we care very much about the well-being and the safety and the health, both mental and physical, of our children particularly that attend this school, but also in the wider community. And I think that laws such as the Student Privacy Act were put in place for very good reason. And I'm quite pleased with the way our school handled this situation. And I would reiterate what our legal counsel said, which was that we did in fact handle it in a most appropriate way, again, in accordance with the rules that are set before us. Aside from the rules, I'm proud of our school for handling it in such a human way. And with that, on to correspondence. <laughs> I do have two correspondence pieces. The analysis of our um, public disclosure proposed collective bargaining agreements. That was our 80-1200 for the, um, the bonus that was given. 
it does mention on the second page that um, the district discovered that it was necessary to change the setup of the stipend in escape in order to correct the PERS retirement error. So this changed the overall cost. It reduced the cost of the benefits for the unrepresented um, disclosure by $761 to $807. So that just has to be disclosed to you. You don't have to uh, approve it. I'm just letting you know that it, we did have to have a, a make a, an amendment to the AB 1200, but they did approve it as it was. They just mentioned that we had to make a, um, a change there. And then I also have the positive certification of the first interim financial report analysis and recommendations. And that's, um, there wasn't any uh, recommendations there. Any questions? No, do, we have, do we have to add a, a motion for the uh, adjustment on that? No, you don't have to approve it. It just has to be disclosed to you that there was an adjustment. Okay. Thank you, though. Consent agenda, approval of warrants. Yeah, I have some. Um, we did have four uh, warrant uh, pieces. And um, so there's quite a few that I want to quickly go over. We did give $540 to Astor Camp as the deposit for Science Camp, but uh, the parents will be paying for camp and be getting out through the PTA, and the PTA will reimburse us. Um, the $600 was to the violinist for the violinist concert that we had, but we also got a grant for that uh, musical concert, so that will also be reimbursed. I put in there um, that we spent $245 in Kelsey Electric because I just wanted you to know that we had some electrical repairs in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Um, and $871 was to me for computer sleeves for the teacher computers that we purchased and the staff lunch. And $2,400 to Renaissance Learning, that was for our Freckle online math and language arts program. $800 to Arts Outreach, it went down a little bit because our art teacher wasn't able to come for a few times in January, so that will go back up. Uh, we paid $926.25 to CompuVision. Uh, $111.51 to Gina Floyd for admin supplies and school lunch snacks. $574.81 to Heidi Nedegar for classroom reimbursement. And then $446.74 for health reimbursement. $1,045.16 to me um, for the piano purchase. We did have to purchase a new piano. Ours was falling off and seemed to be a safety hazard, so we purchased a new one that can be moved for spring singing and such, so we are excited about our new piano. Um, I don't know if I'm excited, but somebody's excited about the piano. Um, $62 um, for a live scan for chaperone for Joan Romero Garcia to go to um, Camp Keep with sixth graders. Uh, $855.13 to Alan Pelletier for a health reimbursement. The district still covers his health reimbursements um, part of his retirement. Uh, $773.72 to Frontier Communications, that's our phone and internet connection. $62.37 to Kim Bramson for health reimbursement. $32.32 to Mandy Young for health reimbursement. $3,110 to Moss Lady and Hartson for our 2022 audit services. And then $208.65 to me. Um, I had to pay for the math Super Bowl, but I um, and an office chair so that we could have more chairs in our conference room because we have more teachers so that we <laughs> and we need more space in the conference room. <laughs> so. And then we have the payroll uh, from January. That's the thing. Uh, if there are any others you have questions about, you can let me know too. Any questions? Or, um, can I get a motion? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented by the superintendent principal. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the administrative matters. All right. So COVID-19, as you know, is a standing item. Um, we currently have zero cases, but we have had three in the past week. 
Um, so there are still quite a few other illnesses going around, but I will say yesterday was the first time in I don't know how long that we had perfect attendance. Everybody here for Valentine's Day. Great. Um, so COVID is still there and we're still, you know, we deal with it. We had a class that had to test twice and so um, we just continue to follow the rules and the laws for COVID. Um, and we did, I also included for you, and you might have some questions about our 21-22 school accountability report card. So that is an annual document that we, um, we contract with Axiom to I fill out all the data and then they give me the report. So, um, and then the state automatically through our um, CalPADS and our P1 attendance and our P2 attendance, they, they fill in some automatic information the state does. Some of the state's automatic information is missing because they don't have it yet. And they, won't, they don't predict that they'll have it till June. So the SARC is not in its most complete form, but that's because the state is lacking some data that they haven't given to the schools to put in there. Um, and they will automatically put it in when it's ready and it's on our website and it's, um, after you approve it, it will go on our website. So we have the last year's one and it will go on your website actually. But this one you do need to approve. And before we approve it, do you want to take any uh, liberty with this audience here to talk about how well the school is doing? <laughs> there is good news for everybody. There is. This, this school accountability report card is a public report card that does um, they, it's a lot of information. It talks about teachers and teacher salaries and averages, but it also talks a lot about our students um, and our, our test scores and such. The only, our, our school is doing very well in test scores. The only area that the state reports upon that we are not doing as well in is chronic absenteeism. So that will be something as a board we'll need to think about and as a staff, I'll need to talk to the teachers about how to address the chronic absenteeism. I, we do have a school where people do go on vacation frequently um, and it does it does reflect because the chronic absenteeism is based on total number of absences. It doesn't matter if they're uh, excused or unexcused. So even if we excuse the absences, it still counts them. And so we are in, in the orange for chronic absenteeism and it's a, it's a color scale, red being the lowest, uh, blue being the highest, and it goes red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Um, and so we're not in the lowest. We are particularly low in the category of special education for chronic absenteeism because we have a small percentage. And so when one person is absent from that tiny group, it is a big impact. So I wouldn't say that, if, that any particular group has a, a bigger problem than any other subgroup, but it is something we just need to look at as a staff. And we've talked about it as a staff already um, because for instance, the law changed this year that you used to have to be out, if you were out five days, you could do independent study, you had to be out five days or more, and they changed it to three or more. So we will do more independent studies so that we get, this, they don't count those as absences. If you get approved independent study, it's not excused or unexcused. It is, and so that will change. It could change the trajectory of the process. It doesn't impact the funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It so, um, but it is public, so the state does report on five um, uh, five factors, and chronic absenteeism is one of them. The suspension rate is another, and they they weight them all the same. So they look at your overall math score, your overall language arts score, chronic absenteeism. Yes, they're all weighted the same. So those are big. Our suspension rate has been zero for a really long time. So we are in the blue for suspension rate. Well. The lower your suspension rate, the higher your color. But um, the and then we're in blue for our language arts scores and green for our math scores. So, and that's all public information on the dashboard. So it's been released and it shows the state and the counties and other comparisons as well. I will move to accept the 2021-2022 school accountability report card. 
But congratulations to you and I feel like I went all naked about chronic absenteeism, but there's lots to be happy about. There's, it's really great, so. Okay. <laughs> and public, where is it public? It's public on the, uh, yeah, on CDE, you can write SARC, and the, our SARC will be posted on our website, but you can look up any school's SARC report. It, they're all, every school is mandated to have one. So. Okay. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 But our test scores and those other indicators from the state are all what's called the dashboard. And I will also say one other thing about the dashboard. It, this year is a little bit funky because we have not had data to compare, and so it, it reports on two different elements. It reports on your current status and your growth over time, and in the absence of growth over time, since we have only did our state test scores this year, they have, it's just a static score right now, but it will next year, the, the color actually comes from your growth over time. So if you are high, you have to stay high and continue to grow or your color can change. So it does get a little, right now it's just a static and this year, if you're high, you're blue. But if our growth isn't showing, then we would maybe not be blue next year. So blue and green are both good. And does this impact your ability to be qualified as a distinguished school? Uh, yes, it's one of the factors. Okay. Not this SARC specifically, but your test scores and the indicators from the state. Yes, it does affect your okay. ability to apply to be a distinguished school. And then the application for that category is performed by you or by the uh, It's actually, the, the a, county. it has to be a staff committee. No, they don't recommend us that okay. we would apply as a school. We would get okay. together and apply to be a California distinguished school. They change the criteria for what you have to, like, these are the boxes you have to check in order to apply, and it changes. So I don't know okay. what this year's criteria are, but I, I can certainly look into that. Right. I would like to be distinguished. I, I think it's a good <laughs> idea. It's, I think it's why we were also a blue ribbon school, because those years we didn't qualify. For a while, you had, to be a, you had to have a certain population of second language learners in order to qualify to be a California Distinguished School, because you have to show growth in that area. And the other issue that we have is our subpopulations are small, and so we some of them don't get reported, because if there are too few students, they don't report them publicly. Oh. Um, they have to have 14 or more students in each subcategory in order for them to be reported publicly. And some some categories, we don't have enough students for them to report publicly. Okay. So. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> um, board policy update. So this is, an, um, <laughs> behind you are the board policies. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. on. Yeah. We just received them. Um, Emily has been helping me and spending time helping me get them at least to this point. So Alan had them digitally, and when he left, I didn't have them physically. So and it has taken us a long time to get them because they're quite cumbersome. So the file, I, it was just a, a little bit of an issue. So. We now have them in paper form. Um, they need to get posted onto our website, and there are various ways in which we can go about doing this process. Most of our policies were approved in 2010. So I don't know that, I can't say they're out of date because some of them from 2010 to now haven't changed at all. So some of them are very likely just fine. Some of them are likely out of date. And so the board's job is to review them. Um, and my thought is that we can either, two things, we can pay a company to come in and do them all, and they would stay for three days, and I would stay with them for three days, and we would, they would run okay. them through their software, and it would cost us roughly $12,000 to do that process. Um, but, and then we would still have to periodically, you all would have to approve them all and read through them all, and I don't know, I think that's a really daunting task. Um, but then we could still bring them and approve them in chunks. But I also have, we have employed um, Emily Pokolsky who has a background in human resources and being a, an administrative assistant that has done this for other schools that she has okay. been at. So she can help us with this process. It will take longer um, and it would take a lot of her time, but I think we could move through it a little more um, Succinctly, there are some that are sort of hot topics. Like we did very recently update our in our transfer policy, for example, from last year. So that one's up to speed and ready to go. But then I could give you maybe 15 in a board meeting, and yeah. and 
tag these five and say we're going to approve these five so they have a new date on no change and these three you need to really look at because there's time there's changes so but it, it takes a lot of personnel time to try to go through that process so it's something we need to do I just am asking board um, guidance on how do you want me to handle it so we can have it done in one shot but it will it will it will be a huge task for you all or we can do it over time <coughs> Like I said, a lot of the policies I can we can contract with um, a company through Gamut that will um, if we just add a pers uh, subscription and I he I send the email haven't got it back yet how much that costs but they will host them on the website for us so it will just be a link on our website and it will just go to our policies on their hosting website um, so that we can do sooner but um, the updating policies is going to take some while. The gamut posting does that um, does that account? Do you, <coughs> they don't do anything automatically. They don't like the monthly updates that come they down from. They don't do it automatically. Don't. They send us a they send like a report quarterly, and it tells us like which are the ones that have changed, and it tell it does give you the exact language that according to the law, these are the exact changes that can be made. So. Yes, that helps a little bit. So it's not we're not making it up. It's it's automatic from the laws. The policies will reflect the laws that are in place. Um, we just have to get them updated so that they do reflect the current law. And is Emily very excited about this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a huge task, and that that's the other thing that I. What would be your up. your prediction time wise? Well, here is the real issue: is that I don't. Currently, Emily is our office aide, or our, our office aide, and gets paid a, I mean, a certain wage. I, this is out. This is this is outside of that pay range. Right? It's like asking somebody to do something above their pay grade, if that makes sense. So I would need to talk to Emily and say, okay, so it costs us twelve thousand dollars to do the gamut. How many hours do you think it would take, and how much do you think it would of your time? I, almost like an outside consultant. Not, not within the scope of her normal job. That's, I guess, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. And when Gamut comes in, if they did their three-day, $12,000 job, mm -hmm. they're obviously in consultation to know, like, I mean, as you know, there are policies that are very specific to our district. Right. So does that require a half a day of It would. They would come for three days, and it would be, time. right, yeah. I would okay. be there with them. And, and then I would still have to bring them all to you, and you guys could, you would have to approve them. Um, but it would, um, it's, the problem is, is that once, let's say we approve them all, it still will take personnel time to continue to update it, because it comes every quarter, and then we have, you know, it's just, it's a continuous right. process, but we're pretty behind. So we need to do something to get ourselves up to speed, and then we can just keep chipping away at it. But it is something that needs to get done either super fast through gamut and expensive and I'm speaking out of turn for Emily but I'm assuming she would cost us less money than gamut but it would take us a little more time but I think we could be thoughtful about it I and a little it, more time six months or a little more time probably about I, it depends on how fast how many policies the board wants to do at the same time do you know what I'm saying? Like, if you guys want 30 at a time, then we can go through a little faster. It would be nice to have it for the start of the next, next year. Next year. And so, yeah. So I guess what I'm asking, I'm putting, I put it on this agenda so we could discuss it, mm -hmm. and then maybe you can give, I can talk to Emily about how yeah. much, and then we can, I think we can make a decision at the next board meeting about what we want to do if I have a little more information. That would be great. Okay. Is that all the information that we really need? I mean, a cost comparison and with sensitivity to the fact that I, it would be nice to have it by start of school. Okay. Because we are so behind. So, okay. so if that's a realistic goal, doing it with Emily. Okay. Or, you know. Okay. Or if there's some melding of the two. Okay. So I will bring it back to next. And again, this is a huge step already that we have them. So now we have them. They're in paper. But if anybody wanted to come look at them as of today, I have them. They're so, yeah. in library. They're in library, library. right. Okay. And anybody could come in if they wanted to look at policies and, you know, put a sticky note on them and they could make them copies if they needed certain policies they wanted to look at. But I just feel good that we at least have them in paper form. If Do yeah. other districts in our area host their policies on Solving does. Solving does. Um, that's 
I'm not the one I'm most familiar with. I don't know. There, we have other schools in our valley who don't have them posted on their website either. I know. <laughs> so we aren't alone, okay. but um, it still would be good for us to to, to have them updated and on the website. Certainly. And I, I, I don't think our website can handle just uploading all of our board policies. I really do need a separate hosting. So I will come back with the cost of that as okay. well. Anything else on that? No, no. So it'll be on the agenda next mm -hmm. month. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll ask for a motion and a, an approval at that point, and we'll pick, and then we'll approve okay. we'll at that time. All right. Okay. Thank you. Business matters. I have the board report. Yeah, I do have the four um, funds there that we always have. The next meeting will be our second interim. Um, budget report from um, what Diane's preparing right now. So we're having a budget budget conversation. Um, and we are it's any discussion any major shifts in the report funds? No. Okay. Nothing on The second interim will have some changes to it that we have I met with Diane today, so there are a few little things that are um, that are coming that are, we had a teacher that had a baby, or babies, she had to, um, and so, <laughs> yeah. um, but, so that, that changes our budget a little bit, because that, we were, we're counting on it, but now it's actually in the second interim budget, because we can show up, like, when her actual leave date was, and when the differential payout, so things like that, there will be a couple of, um, adjustments, adjustments the second interim. and we did get $49,000 from the week. Grant oh, that we yeah. weren't expecting, um, so that is yeah. that's been positive. deposited. Right. We had eight. We were expecting eighteen thousand, and instead we got forty nine thousand. So um, that was a big, that was a big swing in the right direction. Yes, yes. So um, <laughs> we'll that would be good. Okay. Yeah, gives us a little bit of wiggle room. Mm -hmm. I didn't fill out a card, but can I object to that? <laughs> <laughs> to us getting an extra grant. <laughs> can you get some? Um, anything under facilities? No. Our roof is the holding. Roof is holding. Is yes, it's right here, and it's okay. doing just fine. We're dry. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but we still will need to look at the roof, the rest of the roof for the summer. So okay. we will be doing the, the other. This part was the emergency because it was literally dripping onto the computers. But the, um, the one that roof was not an emergency, so we will take care of that one in the summertime. Okay. okay. Uh, personnel matters. Um, I am asking for an approval of a temporary aid position to replace the vacancy in kindergarten because our kindergarten aid moved to our first grade classroom. Um, and so I need, by law, that is the classroom that needs to have an aid in it because of the, has the two case students. So this person will work Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to 12.15, just temporary. So it's a temporary position. I didn't fly it. I don't, I, it, will, they, it will end at the end of the year. Because um, you, you don't actually have a position, I do. Um, so, do you, do you need a motion to approve that? I do need a motion yeah. to approve her position. Okay, so um, I'll move to approve for a temporary uh, position to replace the vacancy <laughs> in the kindergarten class. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Student matters? Anything? I think all students matter, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of it every day. <laughs> Next regular board meeting is on Wednesday, March 15th, 3.30. Same place. Gentlemen, anything else? Uh, I do believe we will, are going to need to have a board policy parents rights on the agenda for the next meeting, mm -hmm. as it was requested from the attendee. We'll need to honor that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Pam, remind us the deadline to get on the agenda is 10 days prior. Okay. So, um, but I think this might count as the request to put it on. Certainly, so certainly. I didn't know so anybody else yeah. wanted to know. So I think we can just um, use this information. I don't know where it would go on the agenda, but I, it'd probably be an administrative matter um, okay. item. So, but it will be, it can be on the agenda. 
Okay. Is, is, is there any direction you want me to take before I put it on the agenda, like information you would need to make an informed decision? I would like to know if somewhere yeah. in those 9,000 pages. <laughs> Is there any address policy of this? that relates to this? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it has the number, so it, it's easy to reference ours in comparison. That's um, what I would like to know. What about legal counsel? Um, um not yet. Okay. I, I, I'd rather not. Okay. I think it's a good idea to just look at this on the agenda and okay. debate how it would fit into that <coughs> stack there. Okay. Without legal counsel. Okay. Eventually, yes, but. Okay. okay. Uh, also, if there's any other precedents in the valley. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and with that, we will adjourn. Thank you. 441. Thank you for attending, everyone.